Okay. When I wake up in the morning, where the orange blossoms grow, yes. Where the sun comes peeping into where I'm sleeping and the songbirds say hello, yes. Can you hear me in the back? I love the fresh air and the sunshine. It's so good for us, you know. <clears throat> you guys didn't have to sing loyalty songs in high school. Uh, we had to sing a loyalty song about Florida. We had to sing a loyalty song about our school. Um, all right, we're going to talk today. I'm a little bit behind uh, in relationship to Watson, but no worries. We're going to quickly catch up because Watson loves the 19th century. And so uh, there, there are a whole lot of chapters about the 19th century. Uh, but right now, we haven't gotten to the revolution, but Watson has, and you guys are already at the Constitution. So let's uh, join Slido. I think people are in on... Um, On Twitch, let's start with how you're feeling after this exam. I'll do the quiz. This is not really a quiz. But appropriate to talk about patriotism uh, today, motivated, patriotic. Motivated. All right. Amazing. Awesome. So far, motivated is ahead. Excellent. Magical. Excellent. Intelligent. Angry. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. All right. Fearless. Amazing. Motivated is the top. All right. There's. <laughs> I, I can't tell who's what, so it's, you know, be, be honest. Let me know how you feel. Awesome. This looks like a good day. All right. Worthy. Astonished. All right. I'm not quite feeling astonished, but I am feeling motivated. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for putting up with Slido and with Twitch and with all this other uh, Mishigayas, as my wife would say, which is uh, nonsense. All right. I want to set up the revolution, motivated and amazing people. Uh, talk about what changed after 1763 with the French and Indian War, uh, or the Seven Years' War, as it's called in Europe. Uh, I want to talk about commerce, crowds, weapons of the gentry, uh, including newspapers and rituals. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Sons of Liberty and the Libets of liberty. Awesome. Amazing and motivated. Fantastic. Magical and worthy. Intelligent and astonished. That's, can you guys see, um, you can see everybody else's response, is that right? On Slido? No. That's where we are. Oh, that's funny. I've got a slightly different version on. All right. And again, for those of you that are coming in on Twitch, the number is not, no, whoops, <laughs> wait a second, 970412. Okay, all right. Whoops. Let's move on. Okay, we talked about triangles before, and it was apparent that the New England was gradually replacing um, uh, England as the center for the Caribbean and South American trade. It hadn't fully replaced it, but had it kind of wedged its way into this triangular trade. And New England merchants were making fortunes by capturing uh, illegally and legally much of the trade of the slave societies established in the New World, particularly in the Caribbean. Uh, the Chesapeake is generating tremendous wealth from the labor of enslaved people who populate the waterways of the Chesapeake Bay, but they had to pay taxes for all that tobacco, and those taxes become 
the kind of thing that Britain decides it's going to use to pay back this war, the, war, the French and Indian War, from 1754 to 1763. And let me jump ahead a little bit here. Yeah, so this is the source of British revenues uh, over time. And as you can see, the land tax was the primary uh, source of British taxes from uh, at the beginning of the financial revolution. But over time, there's a group of people who object to paying these large taxes. They're in Britain. They're also in the West Indies. And those folks increasingly push back on Parliament and say, you need to tax something else. You don't need to tax the West Indies. You don't need to tax British landlords. You need to tax something else. And that increasingly becomes uh, customs to a certain extent, but excise above all. And what are excise taxes? Excise taxes are mostly sin taxes, taxes on things like tobacco, taxes on things like rum, taxes on uh, the very things that New England is uh, exporting. The middle colonies are generating tremendous fortunes um, by becoming there we are, the breadbasket of the New World. And so it's those middle colonies like New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Baltimore, and Delaware. Um, they export the grain that is supplying the sugar colonies. And at the same time, they've created a buffer between themselves and um, native people in the West by pushing Scotch, Irish, and Germans uh, to the far West. Um, by, by far west, <laughs> far west in this period is like Pittsburgh, um, to act as a wedge to push into Native American lands east of the Appalachian Mountains. These changes together make North America the fastest growing place in the world in terms of population and wealth. It's also becoming increasingly divided between rich and poor. Uh, where are we? So we shouldn't be surprised when we look at loyalist areas and revolutionary areas, uh, what were called patriot strongholds in the period after, um, uh, say, from the Stamp Act forward, from 1765 forward. We say that there are loyalist strongholds in the deepest ports, places like Norfolk, places like Wilmington, places like Charleston, uh, and also New York. Those are places where um, the idea of separating from Britain, people are, are concerned about those taxes, but they are not quite prepared to separate from Britain. Meanwhile, people in smaller ports, like in the Chesapeake, uh, like in Boston, uh, like in New Haven, but not Newport, those places we're going to see much more kind of revolutionary ire, much more anger about the taxes that are increasingly being imposed uh, by the British. The success of the revolution will come from these kind of middling merchants, merchants in the smaller ports, um, like Philadelphia and Boston, um, along with artisans and slave owners, to translate their concerns for economic independence to the people at the bottom of the social scale, and yet still retain control. Okay, so what's different after 1763? There are three primary differences that are, af that are important after 60 1763. Uh, number one is defense. And these maps, wait a second here. Ah, all right, there we are. Defense. Uh, one of the ways that the colonists benefit, sorry, I'm going to look back to the q and I realize that I'm just looking at the multiple choice and not to the Q&A. How do we get participation points is a question. And um, the participation points, the 5% uh, is going to come. I'm actually, that's a, uh, I, I had resolved today to post the participation grades. And uh, I'll do that um, today or tomorrow. And that will be based basically on attendance. So that's effectively an attendance. And uh, that's really from Slido. So we're going to download all the Slido logins, make sure that you're there for about two thirds to three fourths of the class or something like that. That's an A. Uh, a little less than that is a, a B or a C. If you've missed a lot of classes, uh, that's more of a problem. But again, that's only 5% of the grade for participation. 
What defense are you talking about? Oh, defense. So, uh, thank you. So British subjects are defended by the most powerful European nation. They don't have to worry about their ports being attacked by the Dutch or the French. Um, indeed, it's clear, or the, or the Spanish. And indeed, it's clear that, that this is one of the reasons the colonies are so wealthy compared to Europe in the 18th century, is that they're not involved in all these wars. Britain is effectively engaged in these wars in Europe, but the US, or not the American colonies, uh, although they, they, you know, they, they were involved in uh, the French and Indian War, are missing uh, the War of Austrian Succession, they're missing uh, the Jenkins Ear, they're missing uh, these other conflicts that are roiling uh, Europe. And so defense, defense by British ships for their trade all around the world is it's defended by the strongest navy in the world. Uh, I'm hoping to have, uh, there's a question about exam grades, I'm hoping to have a exam grades uh, by Monday, this coming Monday. That's the plan. I'm going to work out with the TAs, make sure that we've got comparable grades and all that stuff. Uh, okay, so that's number one, is defense. Most powerful navy in the world. As the crown sees it, though, Britain bought peace for the North American colonies, and now the colonists have to pay after 1763. So what they have is defense. They don't have to worry about Spanish or French or Dutch attacks, um, but the colonists have to pay. So number one is defense. Number two is the West. With the French out of the way, North American colonists can now spread west as they see it. It's clear that to everyone, most everyone, that while the colonies can benefit from international trade, there are also long-term benefits that accrue to the seaboard cities uh, from there being a west. And we talked about this a little bit before when we talked about stores. Um, why would Connecticut, why would New Haven, Connecticut, or Philadelphia, or um, or Boston, or uh, merchants in New York City, why would they be, why would they benefit by people moving west? What's the payoff? What's the advantage for them? The answer, by and large, is that provisioning people who are moving west is uh, an, an important way of making wealth in the port cities, right? So being that country merchant, or being that uh, jobber, or being that uh, uh, New England merchant, uh, makes generates tremendous wealth for uh, British port cities. So the port cities themselves don't directly benefit by you know, access to Western land, but they do benefit by provisioning that Western land. And so the fact that the French are have de been defeated in uh, the Seven Years' War means that North, North American colonists can spread west uh, and take land in the west, uh, in many cases, by taking it from native peoples in the west. Now, that said, Britain also has its own limitations that it imposes on this, and that's the Proclamation Line of 1763. That's that white ridge. I'm sorry for the colors here, but that white kind of uh, dotted line on the East Coast is a proclamation line of 1763. And basically, Britain says, thou shalt not pass. Do not move further west. Why? Because you're likely to irritate um, the Algonquin Indians who are further to the west and start another friggin' war like you did in Pittsburgh. Right? That's a big one, <laughs> primarily, um, is they don't want another war. They don't want to have to send in British troops. The cost of this war was phenomenal. Now, so, so there is a West. There's an opportunity to move West. And if you, if you look at these dots here, this is the kind of line of westward settlement. So there still is land in, say, uh, pl plenty of land available in uh, Georgia or in upcountry South Carolina, in areas that are technically controlled by Britain. But the real attraction is the Ohio and Mississippi rivers, where you've got uh, a favorable climate, um, lots of trees, and um, potentially access to the Caribbean colonies, not on the East Coast, but down through the Mississippi River. 
Okay, so again, there's the what's the difference? The West is now available. Uh, the the um, the limitation though is the proclamation of Lyon in 1760C, which says British subjects in North American colonies cannot move west. I don't know what happened to my maps here, my uh, my PowerPoints here. The third thing that's important that's different is military competency. Having fought for almost nine years in the French and Indian Wars. There's increased confidence in the military cap cap uh, competency of uh, American colonists. Officers and soldiers have battlefield experience. Merchants know how know about military supply and how to supply soldiers at war. Political leaders understand mobilization and finance. How it is that you finance putting soldiers in the field. All of this gives. Um, Colonists, a certain sense of confidence, white colonists, white male colonists, <laughs> uh, a confidence about their capacity to uh, sort of govern and uh, kind of control the region that they're in. The conflict then is going to be about taxes. The history from 1763 to 1776 is really the story of England's attempt to recapture the wealth generated in the New World to repay this massive debt they owe for this war. It's debt that they owe to uh, British subjects, actually, uh, the, the uh, men and women who have bought the consuls, the British consuls in the financial revolution, the, the people who are, have bought this debt and expect to get paid back for it. The year of the proclamation line, someone asked, is 1763. So right after the war. Okay, so what are some of the... Um, so if we look here at this map and see where the Patriot strongholds are, you can see that in particular, um, in Virginia, Pennsylvania, New York, Massachusetts, Connecticut, people in the West are particularly upset about um, this proclamation line. They're being barred from further expansion in the West. Now, it's not that people need an infinite amount of land, but land is actually an important way of not just generating wealth in the household, but also providing for children. Right? So there weren't banks that were reliable in the 17th century. It, saving money was actually awkward. The best way to save money was to buy land further in the West sorry, and make it available to children. Uh, and that possibility seems to be limited. Uh, by the British. Okay, the Stamp Act then is the other thing, passed in 1765. It taxes legal and commercial documents, newspapers, almanacs, playing cards, dice, liquor licenses, or, or liquor. So these are, these are sort of like sin taxes, although newspaper is hardly a sin exactly. Um, there are attempts to kind of tax commerce, commercial activity. Um, and the people who are alienated by this Stamp Act are merchants, lawyers, and planters. Not the people in the, in the West, especially. And it's conflict in the port cities that are going to be the primary um, spark, I suppose. That starts the revolution. Um, right. So merchants and lawyers are the ones that are also. Thank you. Merchants and lawyers, um, as, as Rob asked, are, are the ones. The reason that they're particularly concerned about this is because they're the ones having to pay for stamps. They're the ones having to pay for a stamp tax for legal documents. They're the ones who are having to, to basically interact with the British government almost every day, paying these taxes. How do you get people upset about the Stamp Act? Well, the solution to do <laughs> to that in Boston, anyways, is to go here. Now, this is a little confusing. I was uh, in Boston. I was at Harvard for a year, and I tried to go to Boston Neck, and I couldn't find it. I knew that Boston Neck was this really narrow passage, and it was only when I looked at uh, <laughs> a modern over an older map of Boston that I could see that 
Um, most of Boston is actually recovered land from the water, which they've kind of dumped dirt and garbage and things like that, and then built streets on top of it. So, so I was walking around looking for Boston Neck, but there's no water around it now anymore. Does that make sense? Uh, so uh, I found the street, but it, <laughs> there's no water in sight, and that's because uh, so much of it had been built up. But at this, in the 1760s, this is Boston Neck. You can't get back and forth from Boston, um, you know, from the kind of city to the port without passing through this little narrow passageway. And so what protesters do is they gather at Boston Neck and they stage protests against the tax. Uh, and they're kind of hokey protests as you can, uh, well, they're hokey protests. Um, the um, uh, August of 1865, the Stamp Act is passed. August 14th, some men have two effigies from a tree near the Boston Neck. One is of Andrew Oliver, a stamp distributor from Boston. We're going to talk about him in a second. And another is a boot with a green, vile sole. It's a green sole that's covered with dung. That's the other effigy, is a boot. And this, at the top of the boot, is the image of the devil peeking out. And so, so this is a rather obscure reference, but everyone understood at the time, an attack on Lord Grenville, Greenville, um, and made vile by sticking it with dung, and, um, and Lord Boot. <laughs> so Lord Boot and George Grenville are the people who are behind the Stamp Act in Britain. And so this uh, green boot with a green vile sole on it is uh, the symbol of it. The other person though was Andrew Oliver. And Andrew Oliver is an interesting person. Andrew Oliver is a kind of, um, well, he's the stepbrother of Thomas Hutchinson. And Thomas Hutchinson is the governor of Massachusetts. He's also on the Supreme Court of Massachusetts. Uh, he's also in the legislature of Massachusetts. Uh, this is at a time when you could be in all three branches of government at the same time in Massachusetts, as long as you were close to the king, right? And so Hutchinson gets his brother-in-law a spot, brother-in-law Andrew Oliver, a spot as the tax collector in Massachusetts. And as you can imagine, Oliver is not very popular. Initially, people support Hutchinson. Hutchinson says, don't, you know, don't protest too much about this. Talk, don't talk about natural rights. Uh, he persuades the, the legislature that, um, that it'll be better if they're just pretty quiet about this. As governor, he stamps down on any uh, direct protests. And <laughs> as, the, as the head of the Supreme Court, uh, he, uh, uh, for, for um, Massachusetts, he also blocks any uh, legislation. So as you can imagine, uh, people are getting more and more upset at Hutchinson, but Hutchinson is too powerful. But his brother-in-law, Andrew Oliver, the one who's been given the, um, the, the uh, responsibility of enacting this tax becomes uh, the perfect target. Men waited by the tree at Boston Neck all day, pretending to collect stamps from everyone who passed by. They did this all day. And 2,500 to 5,000 people passed by Boston Neck every day. And so what they're doing is they're taking this thing, the stamp, which, again, mostly only merchants and lawyers had to pay, and making other people kind of aware of it and un uncomfortable with it and angry about it. OK. So by 1765, people had, um, 1766, people had started to um, get uncomfortable with Hutchinson's presence, but they take it out on Andrew Oliver. Toward the evening, a crowd who had gathered at the tree paraded with the effigies to a small brick building that Andrew Oliver was having built on the waterfront. They thought it was supposed to be a new stamp office, so the crowd demolished it. Then they went to Oliver's house, smashed his windows, tore down his fences, and then entered the house, pulled down the fireplace, just then, brother, uh, Oliver's brother-in-law, Thomas Hutchinson, arrived with the sheriff. The crowd picked up the paving stones around the building and started to throw them at the sheriff and Hutchinson, but eventually they dispersed. 
the House visitation had done what it was intended to do to get Oliver to resign his office. This is how protest becomes something else in places like Boston. Directly, it was an attack on a hated enforcer of the Stamp Act, but it was also an attack on Oliver and Hutchinson. And other attacks, the objects were objects of wealth, coaches, elite houses, and theaters. And this is in part because the very wealthiest people in Massachusetts, in New York, in Philadelphia, in Charleston, the very wealthiest people did not want to leave the empire. But it was these kind of middling merchants and middling lawyers and others, particularly merchants who had small ships that only did the coastwise trade, that only traded, say, between Charleston and Philadelphia or Philadelphia and Boston. Those are the people that are especially angry about these taxes, and they're the ones who kind of rile up the crowd. Crowds are institutions in the 18th century. For one, crowds enforce the law. We, we think about crowds now as being... Uh, well, just crowds, just protesters. But crowds in the 18th century enforced the law. There were no modern police departments. So crowds um, were organized as sheriff's posses to enforce the law. The sheriff would deputize a bunch of people if uh, there was someone uh, who they were trying to capture who was on the loose or something like that. That posse would then trace down the person. It was a crowd, very difficult to control crowd. They fought fires. There were no fire departments in this period. Um, crowds called volunteer fire camp companies gathered together to save properties and lives, and sometimes they would fight each other in the streets over a particular spot. So you'd have three or four fire companies in a city, and they would be battling each other <laughs> sometimes over who got to fight the fire, because if you fight, fought the fire, then you would be paid by the person whose house you'd saved. They fought outsiders. Crowds were drawn into ranks and given officers in the 18th century and called militias. Uh, Bear with me here for a second. Yeah, so militias are crowds also. They're armed crowds. They're organized crowds. They're crowds of people who have regular jobs, but once a week show up at a militia ground, or once every other week show up at a militia ground with um, usually a stick, not necessarily a rifle, and drill so that they're prepared for um, uh, attack by the Dutch, attack by the French, uh, uh, Indian attacks, or, uh, you know, attacks by natives in the West, and those sorts of things. Oh, so Hutchinson's first name was one of the questions, and it's Thomas Hutchinson, Governor Thomas Hutchinson. Okay, when Oliver dies, 10 years later, people boo when his body is lowered into the ground. They gather around his body and they boo. When the, the same thing happens with Hutchinson. They're so hated, so despised by the people in Boston at this time, in part because crowds have been riled up by these um, merchant leaders. It's a pretty disorganized group of men at first who gathered together to protect the armors, armories of Lexington and Concord. That became the first group of militiamen that would be that would fight the English army. These men, uh, as you saw in the Watson textbook, were um, uh, kind of threw paving stones at British troops. The British troops fired on them, killed ten of them, and then on the way, as the British troops were walking, marching back to Boston, um, militiamen would hide in trees and snipe at. Um, British troops on the way back to Boston, killing 263 of them over that day in response to the attack. So the Lexington and Concord conflict is, is a kind of disorganized guerrilla conflict in which people are hiding in trees waiting for you, uh, British soldiers to pass by and, and shooting at them. These crowds, though, were seldom deadly. Oh, what other taxes existed besides the Stamp Act? I know you said ships, but I didn't hear the rest. Um, taxes on... Uh, blah, 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 blah. Well, the Stamp Act actually was not, was, a, was a lot of things in, that were in the Stamp Act. Blah, 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 blah. Bear with me here for a second. I was talking very fast. Um, well, basically wills, newspapers... Um, uh, alcohol, uh, uh, any post, any poster that you made uh, had to have a stamp on it. Um, 
any official legal documents had to have a stamp on it. So the Stamp Act was it, it included lots and lots of legal documents, especially, and that's in part why lawyers uh, opposed them. All right. Oh, so sorry, there we are. There's Thomas Hutchinson on the left and Andrew Oliver, his brother-in-law, on the right. And both of them were booed when they were lowered into the ground. People gathered at their, um, when they heard about their deaths, to uh, hiss and boo when they were lowered to the ground. So this, this um, crowd activity was common in 18th century Europe. In fact, um, the king in Britain was attacked by quote unquote Republicans, and this is people who believed in a republic, uh, less interested in a monarchy. And um, these crowds were often uh, kind of violent, and, but, but not especially violent, not especially dangerous. The Boston Massacre is probably the best example of this. Five, um, in February of 1770, a group was milling around the house of a hated customs informer, Ebenezer Richardson. And he, um, he fired uh, into the crowd that was gathered around his house. It was very much like the Thomas Oliver criticism. Uh, he shot and killed a young boy named Christopher Snyder. Thousands went to his funeral in February, on February 26th. A few days later, a soldier was looking for work in a South End rope walk. A rope walk is, a, is basically a place where ropes are manufactured. Um, people walk, or walk with uh, hemp and they're going to tie it into ropes. One of the rope makers taunted him, offering a job uh, cleaning his toilet. And this was privy. And the soldier went back, got some other soldiers, and a fight developed. At the height of the fight, 40 soldiers were trading punches with 40 uh, workers uh, on the docks. A few nights later, a bunch of men who worked the rope walks uh, started throwing snowballs at the sentries of the custom house. This was connected to a long string of grievances, uh, challenges by sentries in the street, bands marching past uh, ch during church services, uh, soldiers getting work when others in Boston couldn't get work, the death of this young boy. Uh, the snow snowballs were a pretty mild kind of attack. The soldiers who were young, set far away from home, serving in a place where they were hated. They were themselves the dregs of human society. They were the people who had been, many of them, um, kind of rounded up in uh, gin houses and things like that. What they saw was a vicious, irrational mob, not an outraged group of citizens. When someone in the crowd of soldiers gave an order to fire, they didn't pause to ask who gave it. Five Bostonians were dead and dozens more were wounded. This was, in some ways, a minor altercation, but um, but it was merchants and others who produced this image of the Boston Massacre, which was widely distributed, uh, framed and put on people's walls. What's unique about so many of the other crowd incidents and demonstrations in the revolution was that there was relatively little bloodshed in them. This was one the bloodiest of them. So the weapons of the colonial gentry, I'll call them. This is not the one percent. This is the kind of the kind of upper middle class, the the people who were had quite a uh, you know some land but not a whole bunch of land, people who had some wealth but not a lot, people who had one ship but not ten ships. These people, people they called themselves the gentry, or that was often the term that was used to describe them. Well, who killed the young boy? It was actually, actually the person who killed the young boy was. Um, Richardson, the person who was the uh, Ebenezer Richardson, who was the person who was collecting the stamps. The soldiers kind of came later. The the, the soldiers didn't kill a young boy. It was uh, Richardson himself. Uh, so the gentry is a term. It describes somebody who's kind of well off, but a class below the nobility. Um, so who are we talking about? We're talking about the leaders in Virginia, uh, uh, not people who were based in Norfolk or Richmond but people who are further west, people like uh, the Jefferson family. Jefferson family was fairly far out into the west, what's now Charlottesville, and um, they weren't, they were not by far not the richest families in Virginia. They were the kind of middling planters. They were people that did own slaves, some of them, like the Jefferson family did, um, 
they were tended to be educated. Jefferson's father was a map maker. Um, Jefferson himself was trained it at a you know at a school in at William and Mary at a school in Virginia, and um, it was these folks that used two kinds of methods of protest. One was newspapers. Newspapers increasingly became the method by which they challenged the British order. The example, and this is discussed in Watson's book, is Patrick Henry. He, um, he himself was uh, a kind of a, his father was a wealthy Scottish uh, immigrant, but Patrick Henry had almost no formal education. After failing at farming and failing at storm keep, storekeeping, he became a farmer, I'm uh, sorry, became a lawyer. And through the law, he becomes a legislator. And he's kind of effective at bridging the world between the buckskin farmers and the wealthy planters. He knows some of the wealthy planters, um, but he knows many of the farmers who are kind of living further in the West, people who don't own slaves and others. In the House of Burgesses in Virginia's capital in Williamsburg at the time, the governor kicks the legislators out because they're critical of him. Oh, two methods of protest are newspapers and ritual. Um, and so they meet in a tavern. The, because they've been kicked out by the governor. And um, his fiery speech leads the Speaker of the House to accuse him of treason. Because he compares jo uh, George III to Caesar. He compares him to Charles I. The House of Tr Burgesses, though, was thinly attended. In part, in part because they were meeting in a tavern. And late in the season, they narrowly adopt five of the seven resolutions... Um, it repeals the most radical one, which suggests independence from the crown the next day. And this is a pretty good predictor of where most people stood. People were unhappy, they were willing to air grievances, but they weren't necessarily prepared to defend um, independence. But what happens next is that Patrick Henry's resolutions, and all seven resolutions that, re that, that are brought before the Burgesses, two of which are, are overturned, are all repeated in newspapers up and down the East Coast. In Virginia, in, in Richmond, in Philadelphia, in Boston, in New Haven, in New York. And they don't say that the House of Burgesses only passed five of them. They say the House of, they suggest that the House of Burgesses passed all of them. And in a way, the newspapers get, persuade people that the other colonies are being more radical than us. Right? The other colonies are fighting more ra are, are are angrier than we are. Does that make sense? And this is really important because it persuades people the edge of what's acceptable behavior becomes wider and wider in part as newspapers kind of propagandize this story and make it a little bit, you know, put, push people that, to the little bit further to the edge about independence. Does that make sense? Okay. So I don't want to call it propaganda because it's not entirely propaganda, but it is in part taking what's going on and kind of spinning it in a way that makes people think that there's a stronger movement than there is over time. And this is really important for persuading people that there is a support for the revolution. So crowd protests, um, sorry, newspapers are one form. The other form is ritual. And things like burial ceremonies are very important. The burial ceremony for our, um, Oliver and, and uh, Hutchinson, um, uh, ceremonies in honor and, and commemoration of events like the Boston Massacre are things that draw hundreds of people and increasingly kind of get people to feel more and more, persuade them more and more that independence from England is important. The group who does the most, this is Patrick Henry, uh, sort of, it's not actually Patrick Henry, this is a kind of later version of probably what Jack Patrick Henry looked like. Are the Sons of Liberty. The Sons of Liberty are the people who take these relatively minor protests and turn them into more radical protests. The Sons of Liberty was a core of committed radicals. They formed in New York and called on other groups to form themselves. And they were knit by a kind of correspondence union. So they communicated with each other by letters primarily. The New York Sun Secretary, uh, Sons of Liberty Secretary, was an instrument maker, John Lamb. And he was at the center of this controversy, center of this correspondence. There were three kinds of men 
that were central to the Sons of Liberty. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but that's really hard to read. Uh, first are dissident intellectuals. People like Patrick Henry, people like Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Paine, and Samuel Adams. These were people who were, Henry was self-educated. Um, Jefferson was, was kind of wanted to be a kind of uh, public speaker, and he knew lots of people in the West. Uh, Thomas Paine was um, uh, basically an artisan uh, who had a scathing tongue uh, and, and a uh, really brilliant um, capacity to, to, to take complicated ideas and make them uh, simple in his book Common Sense. And Samuel Adams. All these people kind of saw themselves as intellectuals, saw themselves as firebrands, saw themselves as not political leaders at first, but people who were going to uh, kind of rally the troops against uh, these hated taxes. Secondly is coastwise merchants with smaller ships. So this was not the Quakers and not the New York Dutch, right? The New York Dutch, the people like the Knickerbockers and the Rockefellers and who else? The um, Roosevelts. Those are the old um, Knickerbocker aristocrats. They're people who speak English. They have Dutch families, Vanderbilt. Um, but they don't support the revolution because they, they see it's crucial to have the continued support of Britain. But smaller merchants are the ones who tend to support the revolution against them. And third, artisans like Franklin, uh, like Paul, uh, like Benjamin Franklin, and like Paul Revere. Benjamin Franklin was a printer. Uh, Paul Revere was a silversmith. Someone like Samuel Adams was kind of intellectual, served as a petty town official. He was a Harvard graduate. Yes, Patrick Henry was self-educated, or that is, he didn't have the kind of formal education that someone like Jefferson did. Uh, so sorry, Samuel Adams was a Harvard graduate. He was trained in the classics and was a devout Puritan. Uh, he didn't want Massachusetts, he wanted Massachusetts to be a Christian Sparta. You know, you can imagine this, this Sparta where everyone was virtuous, when everyone kind of uh, was committed to the common good. A place where hardy, self-denying, God-fearing people would think of the public and not of themselves. Uh, some of these radicals had a Christian element in their thought, like Philadelphia uh, physician Benjamin Rush. Others, like Tom Paine, did not. And, and Tom Paine was the closest thing to an atheist in the 1770s. These un intellectuals understood that they had to work together, um, Christians and atheists, and that their divisions were less important than their common cause. What were their common interests? Firstly, they wanted the American economy to be strong. The intercolonial uh, merchants, the, the ones who connected, say, Philadelphia to Boston, the coastwise merchants, I call them, um, relied on the British Navy, but they weren't tied to the credit, trade, and legal networks of the British Empire. No friends in Parliament, no one to marry into the British aristocracy, very much unlike the Quakers or the Dutch traders. Some were artisans, especially in shipbuilding. They depended on exports to the old world, but for most, what they produced competed with goods that great merchants brought from Britain. And an example of this is Paul Revere, who made silverware and engravings. And for him, it's this trade with the West and, and trade with, you know, internally, the silverware that he produces competes with this British made silverware, which is quite inexpensive. Now, this is not the only, it's not just a financial explanation, but for, for Revere's uh, commitment to the revolution, but he's not one of these kind of elites in uh, Britain, and this is important. Oh, the third group. Sorry, someone asked what were the three groups. Number one, dissident intellectuals. <laughs> Again, sorry about the font here. Number two, coastwise merchants. And number three, uh, artisans. Okay. So these people occupied a place between the elites and the plebeians. Um, you can see this in this image of Paul Revere that he had made of himself. All right, so not a lot of whole, not a whole lot of people in the eighteenth century could afford to have people uh, have people make pictures of themselves. But what's interesting about Paul Revere's picture of himself is that he's in a work shirt, as you can see here, right, with a leather jerkin that he's wearing on top of it, and he's holding what's called his masterwork. Right, because he's a master artisan. There's this there's this hierarchy of artisans from uh, apprentice 
to journeyman, to master. And the masterpiece that you'd produce is that master work. Just like if you get a master's in history or a master's in um, education, the masterpiece is a written work that you've write, written a master's thesis. This is the masterpiece for, a, for an artisan, is the thing that shows that you are a master of your craft. And so it's interesting that Paul Revere can afford to pay the two or 300 pounds that it costs to have someone make a picture of him, but he doesn't put himself in robes and he doesn't, put him, doesn't show off his fancy shoes. And, 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 and what he's showing off is that he's a person who works for a living and he's proud of the work that he does. Another thing that's interesting about the actions and the rituals is that many of them are organized around consumption. Just like uh, stopping people and telling, telling them they're going to be taxed, pretending that they're going to be taxed when the Stamp Act is passed. Um, the organization is around British tea, for example. We won't have goods to, that we buy stamped with a British tax. We'll boycott English linens, and so our own. We'll boycott British tea, and to do this, we'll climb on a boat, pretend to be Indians, and pour the tea into the ocean. And a certain suggest, it suggests that the commercial revolution that's going on in England is also going on in the American colonies, that lots of people are participating in this kind of international trade, and it's by consuming things or not consuming things that they're kind of showing their allegiance. Now, there are limitations to this kind of protest, and that limitation takes place in a place like Charleston. South Carolina is a place where rice and indigo were grown on the coast. And there are hundreds of thousands of Africans living here who bring with them traditions for planting, growing, and harvesting rice that come directly from Africa. They speak a kind of patois called Gullah, which is a kind of medley of English and three African languages, Yoruba, Igbo, and Ga. Since before the 1760s, many whites have been complaining that uh, enslaved people controlled the trade an economy of Charleston. How do they do this? Well, they're the ones operating the ships in the harbor. The reason for this is partly because you know, it, they, they don't necessarily own the ships. They may be living out. That is, they're technically enslaved, but they have um, a ship and they pay a monthly fee to the person who quote unquote owns them. And what they do is they know where all the rocks and shoals are in the Charleston Harbor. This is really important if you want to move goods back and forth to know exactly where the rocks and shoals are and know when low tide and high tide and what's the best route. Does that make sense? That takes a lot of kind of being there every day to know precisely where it's dangerous to travel and where it's not. And Boston Harbor is filled with rocks and shoals. Boston Harbor, Charleston Harbor is. And so th there are mostly um, black stevedores, people who are loading and unloading goods. Henry Lawrence, when he arrives in Charleston, he's a radical in the Sons of Liberty. And um, people think that he has stamps <laughs> that he's going to force on the colony of South Carolina. Radicals surround his, his uh, house and shout, liberty, liberty, and stamped paper. Lawrence tries to convince the crowd that he doesn't have stamps with him. He's not sure what he thinks of the crowd at this time, the crown at this time, but he, he watches uneasily as radicals march through the streets in the largest demonstration in local history and unfurl a huge banner that reads liberty. The following January, something disturbing happened in Charleston. A small group of enslaved people were in the streets of Charleston, chanting, Liberty, Liberty. For the next week, the colony was in an uproar. Messengers were sent throughout the colony, warning of what had happened. One of the enslaved men was permanently banished from Charleston. Um, more ominous was the death of Thomas Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a black man, a licensed harbor pilot, who had frequently piloted men of war um, British ships through the Charleston Harbor because he knew precisely where uh, to go. A black man named Sambo also worked in the harbor and he testified at a hearing for Charles Jeremiah that Jeremiah had told, uh, Thomas Jeremiah, that Jeremiah had told him about a great war that was coming. Sambo asked him, what shall we poor Negroes do in the schooner? And Jeremiah, according to the testimony, said, set the schooner on fire, jump on shore, and join the war the war that was come to help the poor Negroes. Another enslaved person, Jemmy, testified 10 weeks later that he had been approached by Jeremiah. Jemmy knew where a runaway slave was hiding, and Jeremiah asked him to bring the runaway a group of guns he had acquired to fight against the inhabitants of the pro province. 
With this testimony, Jeremiah was hanged, and then his body was burned. What's interesting in the larger sense is that whatever the actual activities of Jeremiah, he was a logical target. He, like the intercoastal merchants and artisans in the northern colonies, is involved, involved in trade that connects the colonies together. It's a small network of men, Sambo, who works on the schooner, Jemmy, who works on the docks, and Jeremiah, who has his own boat. And these men harbor or help runaways when they can. They are, in a certain way, precisely the same kinds of men on a much smaller scale as the revolutionaries of Boston, New York, and Philadelphia. But as the anger of sh the shouting of liberty shows, they're specifically not included in this revolution. This revolution will be about the freedom of white men and women, not black ones. After the revolution, northern states recognized this contradiction. And over time, because of appeals by enslaved people in Massachusetts and New York, end slavery. Some Virginia slaveholders, like uh, George Mason and others, free their slaves after their death, in part because they believe that the, that the ideals of the revolution are violated by slavery itself. But in South Carolina and Georgia, that doesn't happen. Crowds, especially in the South, don't necessarily become supporters of the revolution. In the South, political revolution sometimes threatens social revolution. All right, thanks so much. Sorry to go over.